Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am Castlekeeper Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, uh, today's video I am going to be doing a recap of Session 2 of our Castles and Crusades Blacktop League campaign. So uh, this was kind of an impromptu uh, session that I had on Tuesday night, uh, which was last night. Uh, we... Uh, we were originally planning on running AD&D 1st Edition, and um, I kind of got backlogged uh, with uh, work and the holiday weekend, so I didn't get around to actually finishing up the next uh, gaming session for my AD&D campaign. I have had several ready to roll for Castles and Crusades, so my uh, myself and my seven players uh, picked up and we went into the next session of our Castles and Crusades campaign. So where I left you all off uh, the last time was the um, a number of the players for our Tuesday night games uh, already brought their characters into uh, Blacktop, which is the uh, which is the city that they're operating out of. Uh, it's a gnomish city and it's in the uh, it's it's in a portion of uh, Keel Land, and Keel Land is actually a really great setting within um, the world of Greyhawk because it is not as fully fleshed out as some other regions or countries in Greyhawk. So there's a lot more flexibility of what you can do with this particular setting um, and, and that particular country. Uh, to run your adventures in without kind of stepping toes on, or stepping on the toes of official lore of uh, of Dungeons and Dragons and particularly of uh, Greyhawk. So, without further ado, let me just start doing the recap, and I'm going to do this a little bit differently because I shared this recap on. Uh, I shared this recap on Discord, and so I will actually go through it and use Discord as kind of like a, a memory jogger of what was going on. But I also run it on, uh, you know, so we do our voice over Discord, and I use a virtual tabletop to a certain extent um, for showing uh, maps and, um, and having the player characters' icons and that way we can keep track of various things on there. But it's typically not like a fully blown utilizing every feature of Roll20 because uh, Roll20 is quite clunky. Um, even to this day, I mean, there are certain aspects of it that really don't work great. And, um, you know, so I don't, uh, I don't, uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't also record our sessions um, because... Uh, Roll20 is, is kind of unpredictable, and it would cause a lot of time, and I'm not going to go back and edit things in order to clean up all of that time, because we had about a half an hour um, of downtime, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So without further ado, let's take a look at uh, Roll20 and where we uh, left off. So what you can see here is uh, that this is my... Uh, you know, this is my uh, my group of players, and uh, here are each of their characters. Uh, I see that I have to do a little correction here. So that is uh, Oswald is a bard. So uh, Rodan is a barbarian, and uh, Zartha is a dwarven cleric, female, uh, female player as well. Ainsworth is a ranger, human ranger. Oswald is a bard, played by the OGGM, by the way. Yarg Zajig is a wizard. Um, yeah, and yes, you can definitely see his name is Gary Gygax. Uh, uh, and, you know, backwards. And uh, he is a wizard. He is played by Kelly Foote, a former TSR uh, writer. Seven is a monk. Uh, I see I have to clean up his name a little bit here. He doesn't need the... I do this just so I know 
uh, who the character is and what their class is, uh, just until we, we become much more accustomed to it. This is only our, our second or possibly third session. Um, second adventure session, let's put it that way. Then there's Drenel the Druid, and I'll get into his little icon uh, in more detail. And then Sarif, who is a fighter, who is going to take the place of Drenel. So this is my character group and, and my players here. As you can see, here was the log from the adventure and um, showing some of their strength checks. This was a particularly important critical hit that took place and earlier on, which I, I'm not going to go and scroll back too far backwards, but earlier on there was actually a pretty significant um, uh, fumble uh, by one of the players. So uh, one of the player characters suffered as a result. And so I'm going to switch views and go right into that as well. So I'm going to come back over here and now I'm going to bring up this. And now I'm going to come back over to, let's see what I'm looking at now. Nope, still not looking at it. And nope, it's still not working. Uh, let's try this. Yeah, like I said, you know, these things sometimes, they're a little bit tricky. There we go. That's what I wanted to bring up. All right, so... This is my, um, by the way, this is my Discord channel. So my Discord channel is Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. Um, it is a, it is a, uh, a public channel, so you're welcome to join in. And uh, I always have in my, uh, in the description of every video, a link where you can join this uh, YouTube channel uh, or Discord channel. And... Uh, You'll come in, you'll, you'll be able to join in the general chat, and then if you're interested in being a player in any of the things that we're running, then you'll be given the role of player, and then you could jump in and, and virtually jump into any section that you wish to do so. Um, the only ones that are closed off um, is uh, for specific players, is in the Castles and Crusades roster as well as the uh, as well as the AD and D first edition roster as well. But everything else is wide open. Anyone can jump in on those. So Tuesday, September fifth, twenty twenty three, the Bee Heist. So this was a um, this was an adventure that was going to feature ogres as being the main. Um, the main enemies that the characters were going to have to deal with. And they didn't know this initially, um, but it's the reason why I chose the thumbnail for this video that I've put up there already. So the Bee Heist. All seven party members took up a new quest to investigate the theft and destruction of beehives in a nearby halfling hamlet. Upon arriving, they met with the bee farmer, Melolot Springfellow, who showed them the damage to his farm and a footprint left behind by the suspected vandal and thief. The footprint was barefoot and of the size of an ogre. Uh, initially, it was kind of hard for them to kind of tell what it was. Uh, they had to make some, some wisdom checks and, uh, you know, use one of their, their feet set aside it for comparison and they realized that it was about twice the size of an adult human male's foot. So somewhere around 22 to 24 inches in length. And they then, um, you know, then they, you know, realize that they're dealing with either a giant and then one of the, one of the player characters actually chimed in and said, it's most likely an ogre. Um, so they started to, you know, confer with the uh, confer with the um, the halfling farmer here, and he kind of gave them a timeline. the um, The most recent 
vandalism and, and stealing of uh, beehives and as well as uh, kegs of uh, mead uh, took place uh, about three nights ago. And so, and then prior to that, there was another, uh, another stealing of some of the, uh, some of the kegs of mead uh, two days prior to that. So they, they kind of knew that every two to three days or so, there have been, um, you know, there have been raids into this farm stealing some of his stuff. So initially what they were going to do was they were going to make an attempt. Um, they were going to make an attempt to do a tracking check. So it was already late in the hour of the evening and the party attempted to track the supposed ogre and they failed. They made, uh, they failed that the check. They asked the halfling some additional questions as I already explained. And uh, he suspected that the ogre, um, or if that's what it was, in fact, might return. And so they decided to set up an ambush. So it was sometime in between midnight and 2 a.m. Uh, this was actually the second watch of the player characters. Uh, and when the ogre did return, however... Despite the watch being set up, the ogre still managed to surprise the two watchers. Out of nowhere, the ogre lunged forward and landed a crushing blow, dealing six hit points of damage onto Zareth, the dwarven priest, with his large club. With the rest of the party then roused, it was their turn to counterattack. Zartha attacked uh, with her mace and mist. Dranel, the half, uh, the elf druid, then went to shoot his bow at the ogre, and the most frequent and uh, freakish and catastrophic mishap occurred. He, he rolled a one, a natural one, which is a fumble. Then he rolled a 19 on the fumble chart, which is an instant death. Uh, however, I did allow him to make a constitution check. And so the way that this actually plays out um, narratively was Dranel, the, uh, the elf druid, draws his bow. He pulls back the string and he goes to loose the arrow and... By some freakish accident, the bow splits in half and the arrow is shattered and, and with the momentum of the string pulling back on the fragments of the snapped bow, uh, one of those fragments hit the druid um, square in the face and most likely right through the eye. Uh, and by the time his body had hit the ground, um, his body just could not take with the physical trauma, and uh, his constitution failed him, and he was dead. Second session <laughs> of the campaign, and a player character is already dead. And from, like I said, a very freakish accident, just a series of three unfortunate roles led to this. Yarg the wizard attempted to put the ogre to sleep. However, his spell failed to do so. Zartha cast a light spell on the ogre's club so that the humans in the party could see their target. Rodan, Rodan, um, the human barbarian struck the ogre with a mighty blow, dealing eight points of damage. The ogre fortunately missed his attack or its attack um, once again on the uh, on the dwarf. Once again, the party has the advantage. Uh, they basically won initiative, uh, and the ogre, perhaps confused by the light on his club, or fending off of multiple attacks. Um, Zartha seized that opportunity and landed a critical hit, 
that instantly killed the ogre. All right. Um, so she kind of got her revenge for having been surprised, hit. Uh, she missed the first time. Fortunately, the ogre missed her the second. And then in her, um, her second attack, she was able to swing up and uh, basically, as she described it, she said, I'm, I'm swinging for his, his crotch. And, um, you know, the, the damage dealt by the attack itself um, was enough to kill him outright. Um, but uh, he, had, he had other physical damage that was done that would have killed him uh, within... Uh, within three rounds anyway. I believe she collapsed his lung. Um, and from a groin shot, that was a pretty rough groin shot to have uh, collapsed his lung. <laughs> so you kind of know um, how how hard that she hit him. Uh, now this was in the second watch. So possibly within the fourth hour of sleep. So they only had about three to four more hours to go before sunrise. And... Um, they, they checked upon the, uh, they checked upon the downed druid and confirmed that he was in fact dead. The morning, just a few hours later, brought the resol uh, brought the resolute decision that the party will track down the ogre's lair and avenge their fallen comrade. The honey farmer, equally distraught at the loss, promised the bard, Oswald, uh, who was also a halfling, by the way, uh, that he would name this season's vintage of mead in Drenel's honor. All right, and so this is one way I've described this before, um, and and I will change view very quickly here for a second. Um, this is something that's really important, I think, for for both purposes of role playing, for purposes of world building, and for purposes of um, you know, interacting well with your players at your table is that uh, when a player character dies, um, whether it's so short a time that you really don't even know the character yet, but, you know, um, the player, of course, is invested in the characters that they create, um, you know, but when, when a character dies, I think it's really important to, um, to memorialize that character death to, to make sure that it's an important event and uh one of the best ways to i have found one of the best ways to get players ready to move on from a character death is to have that character remembered in some way now with the party having a bard in it to begin with, and so he can, of course, sing praises and such about this character moving forward in their memory. But it's also important, I think, for the world to know about this character. And so when the players weeks from now are still in Blacktop and uh, they're sitting in a tavern and they, uh, you know, some mead is brought to the tavern and they see um, Drenel's vintage mead on the bottle. All right. They're going to remember that, hey, this was our player character. Uh, this was one of our comrades. This was one of our friends uh, who fell in the service of the League. And so... I think that's really important to do. Um, another thing which, you know, I give great praise to my to my player, um, his character is no sooner dead and we're, we're still resolving what's going on with the, um, you know, with the continuation of that particular combat round. He's already rolling his D6s creating the next character, you know, and, and so... Um, you know, it's, it's not everyone is going to respond as instantly as that, but, you know, as I've, I've frequently said, my players are extremely experienced players and they, uh, you know, they've all been playing for decades 
and uh, they've all had characters die and uh, and they all are just ready to jump right back into the uh, right back into the story right back into the campaign with a new character and of course as a game master uh, regardless of the system that you're using I think it's really important to get that player re-engaged in some um, some way that makes sense and uh, as quickly as possible and and that's kind of what we put together here and uh, and the player even knew what was coming as I go through the continuation of the description so I'm going to switch back now so back here let's see where I left off sorry um, so the party of six adventurers set out all right um, this time with the ranger Ainsworth uh, who was going to be doing the tracking uh, and he was only successful because Oswald the halfling bard had uh, effectively used his uh, once or twice a day inspiration and so it gave the uh, it gave the ranger a plus two bonus which made him exactly achieve his success in tracking the uh, where the ogre had come from so about a half a mile into the hilly wilderness they had spotted what appeared to be a cave entrance blocked off with some boulders after some toil they entered the cave uh, encountering evidence of theft of both the beehives and the barrels of mead now before they actually entered into that cave once they realized that this was the ogre's lair that's when the player who's uh, who's new rolled up character you know <laughs> immediately said I bet you we're gonna find um, I bet you we're gonna find uh, Sarif inside this place all right so he kind of knew and you know believe it or not the the map actually has a jail in it I, I will show you it was like I just worked out perfectly um, how I would integrate that character back into the group so in another cave that um, they battled a second ogre this one appeared to be a jailer with very uh, with very large and cruel looking and wielding a giant two-handed spike club um, there were a variety of torture and you know implements uh, shackles uh, man catchers and the like all hanging from the walls in this particular cave and so they began battling with this ogre the battle went far and away better than the previous early on in the first uh, in the first round seven the human monk critically hit the ogre with a lung puncturing punch mortally wounded the ogre yet not immediately so all right so the ogre was basically on a three round timer as soon as he got hit with that he was going to be dead at the very beginning of the fourth round um whether he won initiative or not he was going down uh at the very start of the fourth round the ogre went to retaliate and ended up fumbling its own attack and crushed its own skull in with its wild swing so the ogre basically rolled a natural one and then <laughs> rolled exactly the same thing that the uh that the druid had had rolled again the 19 which is a critical hit to the head uh causing instant death all right and so the ogre just went down that quickly so literally two die rolls took place and this ogre was dead behind the jail boulder uh, the party discovered one detainee in the ogre jail a human fighter Sarif ibn Akbar of Ket after receiving some first aid from Zareth and finding his armor and weapon in a stash near the end of the jail hallway the party moved on 
All right, um, so now that character has been introduced to the party. Uh, he's still a little bit wounded. Um, he was healed up uh, just one point. Uh, so he has seven of his uh, usual 10 hit points. And um, he is now ready to assist in the next step. The last battle, likewise, went much in the favor of the party once again. This time, Irigs, or Irags, uh, Sleep did manage to put the ogre um, leader down, and the party made quick work of finishing him off, then looting the small treasure hoard and recovering some casks of mead and unbroken beehives. The total party experience was 688 experience points. Um, total treasure was uh, the equivalent of uh, 212 gold pieces each for each character. That included a banner, which was worth about 250 gold pieces, six moonstones, each worth 100 gold pieces apiece, as well as an expert battle axe. Um, and I still have to roll up the stats for the expert battle axe. So, once again, it was a it was a very um, it was a very productive and action packed and uh, and and really enjoyable um, an enjoyable session because uh, the player characters, even though. We never got to really know who Dronel was, um, you know, before he was killed. Uh, the way that some of the other characters um, stepped up and, and, and started to fill in various roles. Uh, I, I think that they, um, they're starting to fall into place with their, um, with their player characters. And uh, we're starting to get a sense of some of their personalities. Um, now, it's been a month since we played uh, session one, so it's been quite delayed. I, I, I have, you know, really looking forward to when um, this campaign can either move to its own day and time, uh, and then I can still continue running my AD&D first edition game on the Tuesday nights. Um, that ideally is what I'm looking to do, is to find a, a day and time for this to move to that. Or what I'll do is I will, um, I will possibly split up the sessions where it's, uh, you know, two weeks with one, two weeks with the other. That way there's no, uh, or possibly even alternating weeks. Um, you know, although I th I, I, I'm less likely to do that. But um, really a lot of fun. I, I think that the, it really showed how responsive um, the players were to having a PC deck. And um, how quickly they picked up, how quickly they integrated a new character into the group. And, um, and like I said, overall, how they role played their player characters interacting with that player death. Now, that's still not wrapped up because now they still have to um, get the body back to um, back to their guild house, and and I will go through a whole process of both uh, world building and social interaction and and memorializing that um, that fallen hero uh, to uh, his proper status uh, in the, you know, in the annals of the Blacktop League because he is the, the first of the League members. You remember, this is a brand new Adventurers Guild that had begun, and this is the first cadre of, uh, you know, of Adventurers in the League. And one of their members has died in literally the, the second week of its inception uh, and the second adventure that, um, that the party has gone on. So um, really cool stuff. Um, really love this system. Uh, Castles and Crusades 
for me has you know m most of the feel of a D and D first edition, uh, and and yet it's much more streamlined than uh, than first edition is uh, just from from the combat and the the skill checks and everything. It's just much more free flowing when you have um, target numbers and and that's what you're rolling. You know, so there's no more looking up, uh, well, who's attacking and what class are they and what level are they, and then look at a, uh, you know, a combat matrix for it. Um, you know, just having a target number based on the AC and any bonuses that they might have and, and just simply rolling a D20 to resolve that is so much faster and easier to do. Um, so, great session. Um, I thank all my players and, and everything. I, I think we all had a good time. Uh, I'm sure that they will chime in. Uh, I, I already put up the, the posting, as you saw, on my Discord server. You know, I've already gotten some that responded and, and put their thumbs up there. So they've enjoyed it, uh, enjoyed the recap. Hopefully they come in and watch this uh, recap. And they're, of course, welcome to come in and uh, leave some notes about maybe their favorite moment in this adventure and uh yeah the players did a great job and it was a lot of fun so looking forward to our next session and uh like i said we're going to spend time uh doing the social aspect of uh, you know integrating and world building again uh so that's very very important for you to make sure that you do those things uh so that it's not just a uh you know you're not just running a hack and slash rpg you're running something that's meant to build a world around what the uh, player characters are uh, adventuring in. So, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen sometime soon. Uh, or at a convention. I'm going to a convention on the 15th and running a different game system. I have to start actually finishing up, tightening up, and uh, writing that, uh, that adventure. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And uh, you have, uh, as I said, just a, a great time, great day, uh, rest of your day, and great rest of your week. And uh, remember, subscribe, like, comment, and share this video, uh, you know, as you feel the need. And have a great day. Take care.